Welcome to the Traders Clinic, your regular shot in the arm of trader insights, philosophy and knowledge brought to you by two professional money managers, Ali Crooks and Charlie Burton. In each episode, we answer your burning trading questions and cover all things from the world of trading. Hello We're again. back. We are. <laughs> so um, what have we got for this show? This in- an interesting start. Um, not, a, not, a, not a subject that you hear a lot about in trading, but a, a phrase that gets gets put around in in business and in, in and in work and productivity, which is how not to be a busy fool. Oh, yeah, in trading, um, mm. uh, the I think yeah, I've I've written this down here: how not to be a, a, a busy fool, and I've got some 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 bits on it. Um, I think one thing that every trader needs to look at when they're in their trading is: are you over trading? Are you being too busy trying to be in a bit of everything and then in, you end up being, as you said, a busy fool? So I think it's it's trying to find strike a balance between the number of trades, the trade frequency that you're going, that that is optimal. Because if you go beyond that, then a lot of people think more more trades equals more money. And I think that if we take that as an example, as, as a classic, well, if I... If I, I've got this strategy here and this strategy here, if I combine them, then I'll get double the return. Mm. And so often it, you know, you're just a busy fool because you're trading twice as much, but actually they sort of offset each other. One's going for a losing spell and the other one's not or whatever. And you, you don't usually find that just doing twice as much equals twice as much return. Yeah. It's a, it's an easy trap to fall into because you can you can even go and do the work. You've you've got the results of the strategy, let's say that you currently trade. You go and test another strategy over the same period and go put it together, and look, I've got double the profits, or on paper, almost if not more than double, because look, each trade mm. compounds. But I always say, if you let's say you doubled the number of trades you place, then assuming your win win loss ratio is the same on both strategies, you've doubled the number of losing trades. So you've got to be able to physically cope with an additional. Let's say, let's say the first strategy is 100, 100 trades, 50-50 win-loss. Second strategy is 100 trades, 50-50 win-loss. It won't be that, but that's the, that's the example. As soon as you go from 50 losing trades in the same period to 100, that puts so much more pressure on you. It also means you're more likely to have bigger losing runs, possibly well, longer drawdowns. So that then puts pressure on you to be able to continue to trade two strategies and stick to the rules of that strategy, which puts a huge amount of pressure on on the trader mm-hmm. so there's a greater chance that trader is going to make mistakes through having to deal emotionally with those losses but one thing that often gets forgotten is if you're comfortable trading one strategy and you bring another one in it could be a different set of criteria in a different market condition it could be um an, a, additional markets so suddenly you've got more to pay attention to yeah. so there's even the 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 risk of just making simple mistakes because you've got used to trading two trades a week as a swing trader. Now you've got to trade four. Doesn't seem on paper like much more, but you could ease. What if you miss one of those two and that happens to be the winner? So you've got that. So you could end up with a worse drawdown in reality than the two strategies put together. And that then puts a huge amount of pressure on you to, to do it. It's You just mentioned swing trading there. And a, another example is you take a swing trader who markets go a bit quiet. Let's say they do go quiet in the summer and they're sitting there. I think I'll day trade today <laughs> because they've got the sk- they could you know they've got transferable skills and so then on a one off that da- random day they decide to go and do three day trade well on that particular day you could have three losers so because it's random in such a short period of time if you want to just go switch and and start day trading you got to day trade every day or at least mm. four days a week whatever to get the the stats coming through, so to speak, you know, on your side, because in any one random day that you decide to to day trade, the results will be random. But again, you're being a busy fool, so you have got to be very careful. I talk to to traders about this very thing because I don't day trade anymore, and I say there are days when I can look at the market thinking that looks quite nice intraday, you know, but I'm not going to go and start day trading it because. As a one-off, if it, if all of a sudden it doesn't and it just rolls over, years ago when I used to day trade, it didn't matter because you know that you're going to be trading again tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that and the odds start coming on your side. So you've got to be very careful of 
can, again, another example of being a busy fool, a bit like someone who's a day trader saying, I'm going to go and swing trade now. Yeah. <laughs> so it's the same thing. There's nothing wrong with with changing status, so to speak, as a trader, but just be careful you're not doing it just because you're bored or for the wrong reasons or thinking yeah. that, oh, it's twice as many trades, therefore twice as much money. Because in your example, there is a um, there is a big risk with um, with doing that. And that talk brings us on actually in this same subject with imagine being your own risk manager. Is that? Yes. Can I do yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. That's um, the next, next thing we wanted to talk because, about. Because um, that may act as an arresting mechanism because we so easily can think, oh, and I'll trade this and I'll, you know, like we've just said, and you end up trading more, being a busy fool. But if you imagine, well, if I was a risk manager, a money manager, would I be going off and randomly going off and trading a different market or a different time frame? Less likely. So again, it can help help if you use that self-talk to say, oh yeah, if I was managing, you know, 10 million pounds worth of client money, would I go and do this? Ah, probably not. And it can act as an arresting mechanism and stop you from over trading. Great. I think that's, I think that's really important. And and that that I think that I picked up on was self talk and having those mechanisms there. Um, and the other thing is, I think what can hit people, they're conditioned, especially in most jobs these days, that they're they're busy all the time. And as humans, we're busy all the time. But as a trader, you, the old saying, you make you, you make your money um, in the sitting, not the trading. You don't you, you make your money in, in you're not actually physically doing something. And I've I've worked with traders where they just struggle with the lack of stuff to do. Yeah. especially once the trade's been placed and yeah. they oh, I should be doing something else I should be learning something I should be testing something I should be you know putting something else it's like the amount of times people say just when I'm talking about risk management we're slightly off topic but yeah you're risking one percent per trade but what am I doing with the other 99 is often what I'll get a reply to because they're in a mindset of what well, if I was buying shares I'd be I'd be allocating all of my funds in my in my share portfolio my share account to specific shares so the thought of well, I'm going to have one percent at risk. Maybe I've got two trades, so two percent of all this money. What, what's what's happening to the rest of it? And I think there's this natural tendency for people to want to be doing stuff because if they're doing something, they're making something happen. But actually, it's it's the less is more mindset. Well, it's like uh, Jim Rogers, the billionaire investor, said. You know, you make your money sitting on your hands, yeah. and it's trying to embrace that philosophy. It's not with traders, even short-term traders, even day traders. You know. You should still, when you look at the trading day, most of the day, you're sitting on your hands. You're not clicking buttons all day long, you know. And so most of the day, even if you were an intraday trader, you're going to be sitting on your hands. That's the way you should always have that at the back of your mind. That's where you make your money. You make your money by either sitting on those trades and letting them run or waiting for the right setups to come along, you know. So uh, eat. Both instances, you're sitting on your hands. You're not always active. Very difficult for people because they come from the normal working world and feel like, well, I've got to be shuffling paper or doing something. Yeah. And um, I remember when my wife and I first got together 20 odd years ago and she'd see me with my feet up on the desk in front of my screens and she'd just say, oh, can you come and help me with this? And I think, oh, no, I am trading. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> so to an average person, they think you're not. But if you're, you know, if you're sitting there watching a two minute chart, you're working, you're, you're mm-hmm. analyzing, you're monitoring what's going on. And in eight minutes time, there might be a trade off. So, um, but where was I going to go? Um, anyway, so yeah, yeah. You, you make your money as, as Jim Rogers once said, and many other investors have said, um, by doing nothing a lot of the time, it's, it's difficult, but that's where the money lies. Love it. Love it. Love it. So interesting questions come in i like this i follow market uh, macro sorry i follow macro strategists why doesn't the market go the same way <laughs> yeah and it's like well the context there again there's context maybe it did when they initially said what they said and then something happened that was unforeseeable yeah. and the the news shifted you know especially what we're seeing at the moment all the news that that's, that's going on it could yeah. be that they were right initially and then the market changed mm-hmm. and so their initial view was correct but yeah. it didn't carry out. So again, it's a little bit of context there. And did w- was there, and did they were they specific with their view? So they might have been putting their view across over a, a macro three year period. 
and you're judging it unknowingly by what's happened over the last six months. So you've got to look at the context of what they were saying and how you're perceiving that information. Because you might have heard it in a way that made you think, yeah, all right, the Dow's going up. Or, you know, mm. the guy was talking about dollar weakness over the next two years. So you then think, well, that means I'm going to have some long opportunities, Euro, you know, Euro, US dollar. And because it doesn't happen in that short period of time, you've deemed them as wrong. So that's the first thing I think is important is you've got to classify what whether they actually are wrong. But yeah, a lot of them are. So I'm not suggesting that, that it's not true, but you need to be able to put it into context. Well, macro trade is macro strategies. Um, again, you've got two different types of camps. You've got macro traders and you've also got macro strategies. And so they are different. Macro yep. traders put their money on the line. Macro strategists are strategists and analysts, you know, so they don't. So, um, again, what they're doing is they're taking into consideration the current information that's a, that's widely available, that they're going to put economic numbers that are widely available, that they're going to take into context. Here's a great example. We, we were at a presentation just a few months ago, and there were some macro analysts there that, that right. evening. We were delivering presentations as well. And the euro dollar contract at that point was sitting around 106 and they were getting really animated amongst themselves they were doing a panel debate and stuff about how the euro was about to go back down to parity against the dollar and so um and that's based on the economic information that they have available to them you know reports what's going on in europe at that time and you know the germany's not exactly been doing well economically yep. or whatever and and yet a few months on from then, the, the euro hasn't been any lower. The low, the, that, that was the low, mm. and the markets have gone the other way. And so I think that's the one thing with... with I love uh, economic data. It's really, it is really important, but there still... Ha the sentiment drives the markets as well. Flows drive the markets. So it's not all based on what the retail sales report was or and whether that's going to drive the market over the next month or two. There are other things at, at play. Now, of course, macro strategies are going to try and take that into consideration, but it just goes to show it doesn't matter who you are, you're, you're going to be wrong, like a technical mm -hmm. trader is going to be wrong. I think the difference with a macro strategist is... They're selling a story. A technical trader is just like, well, you know, this is making high highs, high lows, and there's a story there. Oh, the UK, uh, sorry, the US's economic data is really good. It's really strong. You know, hmm. I don't know, uh, Europe's really weak. But therefore, you know, it's a great, Euro dollar's a great sell sort of thing. You know, there's a story behind that, and hmm. people can buy into a story. It's harder for people to buy into uh, yes, price has just made a new high above the previous day's high or the previous week's high. You know, it's yes. it's not so much of a story. So coming back to your initial point, it's harder when someone says, oh, why do they seem to get it wrong? Well, they're not always wrong. Like and any other technical trader is not always wrong. But it's because there's, it's a story and the story ends up becoming wrong at times that, that it feels weird to the person who's read the story or been listening to that strategist thinking... But you said it was going to go this way, and it all made sense that it was going to go that way. Well, market flows. Market is a future discounting mechanism as well. Yes. So it discounts what's going on in the future. So the economic data that's out today is based on current and past. Obviously, they're trying to look forward, but the market's looking months and months and months ahead in many regards. Mm. And so sometimes it's just that's just the way it is. Flows change, you know. Yeah. With, with what big corporates are doing, big funds are doing, and um, and so there's all these other factors. But so mm. it's not a guarantee, at least no. anyway. It, you can use it, but it's not a guarantee that Euro's going to go to parity. Maybe it does, as you said, in a year's time or yep. whatever, but it's not always, they were looking for it to go down there and then, you know, pretty much carry on coming straight down. Yep. And it was a good example of that. And I think. To finish off, again, you're, you're not able to know how much money, whether they're even, whether they're even invested financially in their opinion. You know, no. So that's another thing. You, you, they can possibly afford to change their mind, be wrong. Okay, so what? Because but if you are just going in on that news and banging trades in, um, 
if it doesn't go that way, you it hits you. So I think they need to be, be aware that you know not every time an analyst says something, they're they're saying it with money on the line of their own. Well, uh, yeah, and also it's an, it's a general opinion. So they 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 even if they're right. So if you've got an analyst analyst who says, yeah, I think the euro is going to go down to parity, using this as our example from a yeah. few months ago, when it was seen at one hundred and six. Well, if it had gone up back up to one hundred seven fifty and then come all the way down, were they right? Yes. Could you have traded that news that that information profitably? Maybe not, because you might have had a stop at one hundred seven. Yes. So you said, "All oh, right, great. We're sitting at one hundred six. I'll put a stop at one hundred seven, and it's still gone to one hundred seven fifty, and then rolled over." So there's one thing having a uh, a view on something as another thing as coming back to what you said, trading it. And so, you know, we can be right. You and I are right on the markets quite a lot of the time. Doesn't mean to say that our trades are always going to be right because yeah. we're going to have, we, you have to have stops in the market. Being right, I, I say this to all my traders, being right on direction is one thing, but having the same winning trade on that direction yeah. is another. Yeah, exactly. That's the, uh, the privilege that is afforded to a strategist. Exactly. Less, think, less so a trader. <laughs> and I think that's a really good point to end the show. It is indeed. His name's Charlie Burton. And his name's Ali Crooks. Trade safely out there.